Welcome to the New York City Health and Hospitals September Surgical Symposium. I'm Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, the Chief of our Pediatric Surgery Division, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about some of the exciting stuff that's going on here at Kings County. Um, to do so, I have a presentation that I'd like to share with you. So first I'd start, like to start with a little bit of a brief intro about what a pediatric surgeon even is. So as pediatric surgeons, we take care of patients from newborns to adolescents and teens, and we take care of a broad range of clinical entities, and we have a variety of different ways that we can take care of all of these different things. Common things for pediatric surgeons to take care of include appendicitis, umbilical and inguinal hernias, and circumcisions. But we also take care of congenital anomalies in some of the tiniest patients here in the hospital. We also help to take care of pediatric cancers. We take care of children who have sustained injuries or, or have um, been victims of uh, trauma. Uh, we will take care of chest wall issues, inflammatory bowel disease, other common things that we will see include pyloric stenosis and intussusception, and many of these things we're now able to take care of with a minimally invasive approach or a laparoscopic technique, where rather than having a big, long incision for surgery, we have multiple small incisions, which are cosmetically nicer and are able to allow the patients to recover from surgery faster because we're dealing with less postoperative pain. So who's on our team? So Dr. Francesca Velchek has been here at Kings County for many, many years, and she remains a vital uh, element uh, to the team and a critical leader here for pediatric surgery at Kings County. As I said, I'm Colleen Fitzpatrick, and I joined the team almost a year ago and am looking forward to continuing to grow the program here at Kings County. Dr. Ileana Gaffar joined the team in June. And with her addition to the team, we've been able to expand our coverage. Um, and it's really been nice to have additional colleagues joining us. And going forward, Dr. Nana Bergrodia will be joining us hopefully by the end of the calendar year. And we've also expanded to include two mid-level providers, a physician's assistant and a nurse practitioner. So with the growth of our team, we're now able to provide continuous call coverage for all inpatient and emergency services. Additionally, we've been able to expand access to outpatient appointments. And so between January and July of this calendar year, we saw 370 patients in the practice setting, which is a significant increase from what we've been able to do in the past. We've also seen increased throughput in the operating room. Um, from January to August of this year, we were able to perform 153 surgeries, which is also a very significant increase in what we've been able to do in the past, especially in light of the fact that things in the operating room have been slowed down from the COVID pandemic. So the fact that we've still seen that degree of increases is, is very exciting. So a little bit more about our outpatient practice. We're located on the fourth floor of the E building at Kings County. Um, we have clinic every week on Thursdays and every other Friday. Patients can be referred to the clinic through a number of mechanisms, but most typically access is, is via referrals that we get through our Epic computer system. If for some reason people are having a hard time getting a hold of our team through Epic, they're always welcome to call the office. Our phone number is 718-245-4145 or extension 4146. And if none of that works, you can always email me, um, fitzpatc at nychc.org. To help with getting patients scheduled for the operating room, um, we've got great support from a patient navigator. Um, our current patient navigator comes to clinic when patients are scheduled for surgery and is able to serve as a direct contact for families. Um, she's able to enhance the ease of the scheduling process and to really make it so that it's a seamless process for our patients and our parents as we move forward with surgery. She helps to coordinate pre-anesthesia evaluation if that's needed. She'll help to coordinate COVID testing, setting updates for appointments. And in most instances, 
it's she's it's a matter of her just scheduling the date of surgery though occasionally some patients depending on the operation they're having may require an overnight stay or rarely will be pre-admitted to the hospital prior to surgery but our patient navigator is uh, helpful with managing all of these things so that again it's easy for parents and a seamless process for them this is just a brief overview of what our case mix has been so far this year. As you can see, we've done a lot of circumcisions. Um, it's our hope that as our practice continues to grow, that we'll have more diversity in the case mix and that these numbers a year from now will be maybe two to three times as many. And again, a, a little bit more diverse in, in the types of cases that we're doing. Our team is also very involved in the educational activities going on at Kings County. Uh, we're involved with the general surgery residency program. We have residents that rotate with us on service. Um, we uh, have ongoing teaching with them as we're engaging in patient care, but then have also started some more formal academic teaching conferences. And we also participate in some of the um, residency-wide educational programs. We'll also have medical students. We have both third and fourth year medical students rotating on our service. The third year medical students are usually fulfilling their core general surgery requirements. Many times they're either interested in going into surgery or they may be interested in going into pediatrics and therefore want to get a little bit of a perspective on what pediatric surgery is like. We also help to support the pediatrics residency, both with teaching conferences as well as offering an elective rotation for the pediatrics residents to rotate on the surgical service so they can gain a little bit more understanding about some of the surgical pathology and things that they may be referring to surgeons uh, throughout the rest of their career. So one of our main goals as we expand our service is to become verified as an American College of Surgeons Pediatric Trauma Center. The American College of Surgeons is an uh, accrediting body that will help to ensure that places that have been designated as trauma centers have all of the appropriate resources in place to care for critically ill and injured children. So in doing so, we will be looking to bring a trauma program manager onto the team, and this person will help to oversee all the administrative responsibilities of the program. As we move toward setting up this program, we will be establishing patient care guidelines, which we will then continuously look at and review through a um, relatively uh, stringent quality improvement structure so that while we have the resources in place, we continue to make sure that we're using them in the best way possible. And when we talk about the resources, in addition to the administrative piece of things, it also is a matter of what do we have clinically available. And so in addition to other people, um, critical team members include the pediatric surgeons, the orthopedic surgeons, the neurosurgeons, our pediatric radiologists, our pediatric anesthesiologists, our pediatric intensive care unit. And we also need to make sure that we have the equipment and supplies available. As you can imagine, the equipment that we use for children is much smaller and much more varied in size than that which we use for adults. <clears throat> but why does why do we need pediatric trauma center designation versus just being a trauma center? The reason is that pediatric patients are unique. Their physiology is different from adults. There's a common saying that kids aren't just little adults, and we always laugh when we say it, but it really is very true. Children have growing bodies with different sized body proportions. For example, an infant and a toddler, their head is much bigger relative to the rest of their body, and so this patient population is at bigger risk for sustaining head injuries with things that wouldn't necessarily cause a head injury in an adult. Um, they engage in different activities with different injury patterns. I can tell you, I've, it's been a long time since I've been climbing, climbing on a jungle gym and been at risk for falling and breaking an arm, but that's also a common thing that happens in children. They're also a vulnerable population. As much as I wish that we never saw this, child abuse or non-accidental trauma is something that we do witness. And so it's really important that the people who are caring for our pediatric trauma patients know the signs to look for and are able to provide the protective services needed to care for our children. We also worry about how our patients are evaluated when they come in with a traumatic injury. Children have increased sensitivity to ionizing radiation. And so what that means is whereas in an adult patient where you might not think twice about ordering x-rays or a CAT scan, 
We do think twice about it in children because we don't want that ionizing radiation to have long-term impacts on their growing bodies. And the other thing, and this is actually a really nice thing about caring for children, is most of them are very healthy at baseline. And so they're very resilient um, and they will oftentimes bounce back from pretty significant injuries and really recover very nicely and, and still be able to go on and have meaningful and full lives. And so it's, it's very gratifying to be present at that moment to help them through the trauma, but then to see them go on and grow. And so this is actually a, a clinical case, um, just to illustrate some of the, the differences between children and adults. Um, so what we're seeing here is a, a seatbelt injury. Um, so if you think about children sitting in a car with a seatbelt, most cars and most seatbelts are designed for adults. And so where the seatbelt should um, rest on the bones of the pelvis in an adult patient, in children oftentimes it can slip up higher and actually the seatbelt causes trauma um, because the seatbelt rather than being stabilized by the bones of the pelvis actually impacts the soft tissues of the abdominal wall. And so we see a big bruise across the abdomen, which we call a, a quote unquote seatbelt sign. Um, and while that looks painful on the outside, the critical piece on the inside is we see a loop of intestine where the blood supply has actually been ripped away from it. Um, and, and this segment of bowel will need to be removed um, so that this child doesn't have additional issues from it. And so just having an awareness of some of the different injury patterns that children see is really important when we're providing pediatric trauma care. And so what I'd like to do now is just move on to some of the um, interesting types of cases that we've seen here, some, some common things um, that we see in pediatric surgery, but just to, to talk a little bit about what it is that we're doing and, and what we hope to, to continue growing. So pyloric stenosis is actually a, a relatively common condition that we will see in pediatric surgery. It has an incidence of about one in 400. And these patients typically present at about one month of age, and they'll usually come into the emergency department with non-bilious projectile embasis. Their parents are usually miserable because nobody's getting any sleep at home, their babies are always hungry, and they're always doing the wash because the children's clothes are always getting dirty. And so when we have this presentation, um, we will actually rely heavily on our uh, pediatric radiology colleagues to do an ultrasound of the pylorus um, because we're looking to see if the pylorus has, um, has this condition of pyloric stenosis. And what happens in pyloric stenosis is that the muscle, the pylorus muscle, which is serves at the outlet of the stomach becomes thickened and enlarged. And instead of letting the stomach contents empty, it actually causes an obstruction at the outlet of the stomach. And so these are just some clinical pictures um, of uh, an ultrasound from pyloric stenosis is on um, the left side of the screen and on the right side of the screen is an upper GI study. Um, and again, this speaks to the collaborative nature of pediatric surgery and how we have to work with our colleagues very closely. And, and again, our pediatric radiologists are, are critical in this part of things. And so when we have this condition, what we do is we take the patients to the operating room and we simply make an incision in the muscle layer, um, in that thickened muscle. What that does is the muscle then springs open and it alleviates the obstruction at the outlet of the stomach. And over time, that muscle gradually returns back to its normal size and shape. Um, and so if you were to go back and do surgery six months later, you would never know that anything had been done. Um, but so these patients get admitted to the hospital. Oftentimes they'll require fluids prior to surgery because of how much throwing up they've been doing. And then the operation that we do, it's called a pyloromyotomy. This can be approached through a number of different ways. In the top picture, you see uh, uh, how we would approach it if we were doing it through an open incision. And in the bottom picture, you see what it looks like when we do it laparoscopically. Um, and then once the surgery is done, patients are usually able to start eating and drinking a couple hours after surgery and typically go home from the hospital in one to two days. And again, this is another very gratifying operation because when the parents come back to see us in the office, everybody's well rested, they're doing a lot less laundry and their babies are gaining weight and thriving. Malrotation is another uh, very typical classic pediatric surgery problem. Um, the incidence is, is certainly less frequent than pyloric stenosis. It has about a one in 5,000 incidence. And these patients, rather than presenting with non-bilious emesis, present with bilious emesis. And in fact, when a patient in the newborn period presents with bilious emesis, we all think of this as a surgical emergency until we can prove that it's not. Um, and so, so what is malrotation? So as human beings grow and develop, 
the intestines go through a very specified um, sequence of events where they um, rotate around the blood supply to the intestine and become attached into the abdominal cavity in a very system or very um, a classic pattern. And, and the classic pattern is what you're seeing here in this picture where you have the stomach coming down to the first part of the small intestine then into the small intestine and onto the the colon and it's it's relatively spread out across the patient's abdomen so this picture shows what things should look like normally um, and then this picture is what an upper gi study or a study where we have the baby's drink contrast looks like when the anatomy is where it should be and so if you can kind of think back to that previous picture, you see the stomach coming down, you see the first part of the small intestine, and if we were to let this study continue going on, we would see the small bowel fill up with contrast and then ultimately the colon. In malrotation though, compared to that picture where the intestine was sort of spread out across the abdomen, the bowel is actually not spread out in the way that it should be, and it, it becomes relatively bunched up and close together. And when that happens, the bowel is at risk for twisting. And when that twist happens, it's something that we call a midgut volvulus. And the reason that this is so worrisome and so concerning is that when the intestine twists on itself, the blood supply twists. And when the blood supply twists, you can cut off the blood supply to the intestine. And then that can lead to very, very significant loss of length of intestine. And so this is the reason why when we have a patient with bilious emesis, we're very excited about it um, in, a, in a very concerned way because this can be something that can be uh, catastrophic and devastating if, if the malrotation and or volvulus is missed. And so, in contrast to the normal upper GI study, this is what an upper GI might look like in a patient with malrotation. Here you have contrast coming down and filling the stomach, and instead of following that normal looking pattern, you can see it just kind of corkscrews down the right side of the abdomen and all the bowel is bunched up on that side. And this is a patient who would be at risk for having a twist of the intestine. And so when we find this condition, um, this is what it looks like in the operating room when we see the bowel twisted around itself. Um, you can see at the, the um, left of the picture, there's a lot of small intestine. And as you move across to the right, it seems funnel shaped as it comes down towards the blood supply. And you can see there's several loops of intestine wrapped around the bowel. And so this is something where we untwist the bowel. And then we don't actually return the bowel back to its normal position. It's something that you, you, we wouldn't actually then be able to do without creating a different kind of twist in the bowel. But what we do do is we spread the intestine out so that it's, it's far apart in the abdomen and it decreases the risk of having twists in the future. And so this is what our goal when we do an operation for malrotation is to have things um, end up in this position at the end of the procedure. And you can see, this is that patient whose bowel was twisted. It's not only been untwisted, but we've now opened it up so that it's nice and broad and spread out. And the goal is we put this back in the abdominal cavity in this orientation, and by having it so spread out, it keeps it from being able to twist again in the future. And we have had a couple of cases of patients with malrotation here within the last year. Um, intussusception is something that we will see as well. Um, so an intussusception is when the bowel sort of caught, gets caught up on itself and, and telescopes in on itself. Um, in children, it's very common for that to happen at the very last part of the small intestine going into the first part of the colon, um, which is what you see on the um, uh, left side of the screen, or excuse me, on the right side of the screen. Um, and again, intussusception um, is something that we work closely with our pediatric radiology colleagues to make the diagnosis um, and actually also to help treat it. So these patients will, as I said, they're usually toddlers. They'll present with uh, intermittent colicky abdominal pain. They may present with what we classically describe as current jelly stools where there may be some blood in their stools. Um, and we get an ultrasound where we can see the outer circle, which represents the bowel that's on the outside and then the inner matted um, sort of brighter appearance bowel is the bowel that's uh, telescoping in. And so not only do our radiology colleagues, as I said, help us make the diagnosis, but then they will also, oftentimes also help us with the treatment. And so with um, contrast studies, either using um, liquid contrast, in this instance it's a barium study, 
or using air as a contrast medium. By pushing it retrograde through the patient's colon, they're able to push that intussuscepted bowel out and get it back into a normal position. If our radiologists aren't able to do this, then the patients do need to go on to surgery. And that will happen sometimes if the intussusception has been longstanding or if it's a particularly large intussusception. And so if we need to go to the operating room, um, this is uh, what we might find. Um, so you can see um, there is the outer, more distended looking bowel, and you can see some small bowel that is um, uh, caught up in that larger bowel. Um, and when we find this, we will oftentimes try and push the bowel out. Um, and if we can do that successfully and the bowel looks healthy, um, you know, then we know we've gotten things reduced. But sometimes we are unable to get things reduced because there's so much inflammation and so much swelling. And so sometimes these patients will actually require a uh, bowel resection. Um, and we've actually, we've also had a couple of intussusception patients while um, here in the last year, some that have been able to be successfully managed with radiology and a couple who have had to go to the operating room. A necrotizing enterocolitis, this is um, another entity that we see, and, and I think of all of the consults we've had from the neonatal intensive care unit so far, this has probably been the one that's been most common. Um, and so necrotizing enterocolitis is an inflammatory or infection pro infectious process of the bowel that can lead to bowel perforation. It's oftentimes seen in preterm infants. And despite years and years of very, very extensive research, we still really don't have a great handle on exactly why it happens. Um, and so it's, it's still something that can be very challenging to manage and something that can be challenging to treat. Um, not all patients who develop necrotizing enterocolitis require surgery. Um, some can be managed with just um, resting the intestines and treating with antibiotics. Um, and again, you know, I, I, pediatric surgery is very much a collaborative effort, and this is something where we are working very closely with our neonatology colleagues in figuring out how to best manage the patients and trying to make the decisions between which patients don't need surgery and which ones do. Sometimes it's a very clear question to figure out. Other times it can be uh, quite a bit more challenging. And so these are a couple of x-rays that are uh, very classic findings that we see in severe necrotizing enterocolitis. And I don't think anybody would argue that this is a patient that needs an operative intervention. Um, but in the, I'll start with the image where the patient is upright in the x-ray or, or upright appearing in the x-ray. You can see the bowel has a very sort of um, uh, soapy looking appearance to it, soap sudsy looking appearance. And you can also see the bowel wall outlined with gas. And that's because as the bacteria and the inflammation has progressed, gas is building up within the wall of the bowel. Um, if you look over the patient's right upper quadrant, over where the liver is, you can also see that the patient has portal venous gas. And so sometimes that gas that builds up in the wall of the bowel actually works its way into the bloodstream and we'll have this finding in the liver. And then if you look at the picture where the patient is um, on its side, you can clearly see at the very top above where the liver is, there's a, an area that's very dark, which represents free air in the abdomen. And that's indicative of a bowel perforation. And, and that's usually a clear indication that the patient needs an operation. So sometimes we will have the findings of pneumatosis, which is where we have that soap bubble appearance to the bowel, and we may have portal venous gas, but we don't have the free air. And that might be a patient who actually might respond to antibiotics, not always, but sometimes. Um, but typically, once you get to the point where you have free air inside the abdominal cavity, we have um, no choice but to do uh, some type of operative intervention. Um, and what are our operative options? Um, one is to simply place a drain in the patient's abdomen at the bedside. That's an option that we might be more inclined to pick in a very, very small uh, preterm infant. Um, or we can do a surgical exploration where we will remove the portion of the bowel that is necrotic and not healthy. Um, and oftentimes then create intestinal stomas, which we will typically go back and reverse in about two months. But once the patient has recovered, is doing much better and has had some time to do some growing. Um, these are procedures that we are actually um, 
looking as we go forward to be able to do at the bedside in the neonatal intensive care unit. This is um, something new that we've been working on here at Kings County over the course of the last year. It's not necessarily new in the field of pediatric surgery, but it's new here to our hospital. And this has been a really um, extensive collaborative, collaborative effort between the neonatal intensive care unit, um, our anesthesia colleagues, the nursing staff, both in the ICU and in the operating room, um, our sterile processing team, which supports us with all of our instrumentation and supplies, as well as our infection control team to make sure that as we move toward doing this procedure, we're doing it in the safest way possible. And so hopefully this gives you a little bit of a flavor of what we do as pediatric surgeons. Um, we again, cover a broad range of diseases. We um, take care of patients from some of the, the tiniest of newborns all the way up to teenagers. Um, some of our operations are fairly invasive and other ones can be done through a much more minimally invasive approach. Um, as I said, our team's done a lot of growing. We're excited with the things that we've seen here in the last year. Um, and we look forward to uh, continuing to grow and to expand the care that we can provide for children here at Kings County in Brooklyn. And so I think that is the, the conclusion of the pediatric surgery portion of the Kings County Health and Hospitals Surgery September Symposium. And again, I'm Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, the Chief of Pediatric Surgery, looking forward to working with you as we care for children here in Brooklyn. Thank <laughs> you.